Stewart, who is going to be talking to you about user interface security and homographs attacks. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the talk. I know it's pretty late, but yeah, we really appreciate the fact that you guys uh, made it. So uh, here's a quick intro about myself. Like, my name is Julio Sosa Fort. I'm director of professional services and partner at Blaze Information Security. But yeah, let's just move on, make a quick intro about the talk. So since the introduction of Unicode in, in, in domain names, so a series of security implications have like, appeared, uh, came along as well. So the presentation aims to discuss some security risks around internationalized domain names and how applications such as browsers um, or email clients and like secure messengers as well, they fail to handle IDNs in a secure way and end up exposing users to unnecessary security risks and by making uh, it very easier to, for phishing attacks and visual spoofing to materialize. So here's a quick agenda uh, about the talk. So we start presenting, like speaking about internationalized domain names, how they work, how they can be registered, and so on. And we move on to talk about homographs uh, and the associated security risks that come along with them. And then we explore how user agents, in this case, like browsers and email clients and so on, how do they react to homograph attacks, and later also show some practical attacks against some of them, and how we can also defend ourselves, and then we're going to end up like wrapping up the talk afterwards. Uh, so yeah, now we're going to speak about internationalized domain names and uh, the emergence of of the IDNs. So essentially, the internet was never designed to be multilingual. So it was created, well, mostly United States, uh, using ASCII characters, so that is like Latin uh, characters. And domain names have always been confined to be Latin-based characters, as, as I just mentioned. However, like there are billions of people that do not have Latin-based languages as their first language. And kind of the way internet worked, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually mainly still works. It somehow excludes the fact that like these people use uh, want, would like to use their own language, their own alphabet to well, to express themselves uh, in the internet. Um, and because of that, like I can ended up coming with a resolution called like uh, there was like a version of, of the internationalized domain names that it. Um, ended up giving a lot of support, like this wide support, to, to Unicode. Like, this was like around some two decades ago. Uh, and the support for Unicode, like, because Unicode, uh, it ended up uncovering different languages um, that, like, say, Cyrillic alphabet, like so for Russian, for some really old, ancient uh, European languages, uh, and so on. So this is why like, they decided to go with Unicode for that. But then uh, we have a little technical problem when uh, when when in, like ended up uh, implementing IDNs, uh, and the main technical problem here is that DNS and like uh, as you guys know very well, DNS is like the some of the building blocks uh, of the internet, and it's only ASCII, so it doesn't really speak Unicode, and because of that, so they they come up like with uh, a different like way to make this glue. Um, and, and the fact they come up with this, uh, something called Punicode. So Punicode essentially converts Unicode to ASCII. Uh, and then, for example, it converts this emoji of this nice little call here, .ws, which, by the way, this is actually a valid domain. This actually exists, to xn-and dash dash something else like that, or uh, obb.at, which is the train company from Austria, so this also gets translated into, into Punicode in order to DNS to actually work with that. And then the user interfaces will do the user-friendly part of things and will convert back and forth. And IDNs and Unicodes and so on are lots for things like this. There's like poop.la. This, actually, this actually also exists. This is like a poop emoji uh, and domain name. Uh, we'll see later on like about some rules around that. And or I love tacos. This also exists too, again with an emoji. Or completely full Cyrillic domains, including even the top-level domain, 
uh, which is, by the way, the full ver version version of, of Yandex. And this is called also like a full IDN, as we're going to see uh, later on in the talk. Um, yeah, as I said, well, actually, it came much faster than I actually remember it. Uh, so this is like partial IDNs, so obb.at, which means that the, there is some internationalized characters here, like this O with the double thing on the top, dot, but the TLD is AT, so you use the Latin alphabet. Uh, whereas we have this full IDN ones, which in this case, I don't know Russian, so I don't know how to pronounce that, but this points to the Kremlin um, official website. So now we're moving on to homograph and talk about security risks and some considerations associated to it. So Latin script, for example, it can represent more, a variety of languages. It can represent, for example, Portuguese, Spanish, English, like Italian, French, uh, and a bunch more. And then um, also the fact that I would like to speak about is that different scripts, they share numerous characters that either look exactly similar or have a very strong resemblance. So what I wanted to explain here is, for example, there are like some characters, say A in, in Latin, uh, the Latin script, that it has a very, very strong resemblance to something very similar in Cyrillic or in the Greek alphabet and other alphabets out there. So, and they are called confusable homographs. As we can see here, like the first part of things, like the number one is actually Latin, and this is the Unicode code point of it. And the second one is the one in Cyrillic. And even if we zoom this a lot, it's very, very hard to distinguish them from a visual standpoint. Uh, there is also an O in Latin, and there is this O with a horn but in, also in Latin. So even the same language and the same script has some characters that they look alike a lot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're zooming in here a lot, so you can see the actual horn in the O. But with a very small screen and depending on the font, this can be actually very hard to tell. Also, we have here P and uh, P in or well, or something like that in Cyrillic. Uh, like, uh, apologies for those that actually speak Russian. I probably uh, didn't really speak it properly. Uh, there is also like, and the list goes on and on. Like this is a small, a small C, and in Coptic, which is I don't know, even know which language it is, uh, has something very similar. And also in Cyrillic. So like you can go to like to Graphemica, which is actually well, it's coming next slide. Yeah. So Graphemica.com, there is pretty much like a whole list of, of uh, different Unicode uh, code points and symbols and so on, and you can actually find uh, many of them that are confusable with Latin characters. So now we're moving on, speaking about user agents and homograph attacks and how they handle it. So font renderization and visual spoofing is our next topic. There are like a bunch of important factors that we're going to see uh, in the next upcoming slides. So these attacks, they are mostly um, they happen a lot because of a few important factors. So the way the font is actually rend rendered in into the display, so display size, font size, and they all play a role in fooling a user, actually, into believing that a domain that he's visiting or clicking is not a legitimate one. So as we can see here, like using the font Tahoma 68 point, um, in Latin, apple.com, and there is using Apple with Cyrillic confusable, there is absolutely no way to distinguish this from a visual standpoint. So even if we use another font, like uh, Bookman Old Style 70 point, uh, we can see that oh, there is a little thing off between the L and the, the other L for Apple, which is actually not an L, it's just a capital I, but in Cyrillic. And there are other fonts that they actually do a better job at making these things uh, distinguishable. As you can see here, uh, the one Cyrillic is pretty off. So you can actually tell there is something dodgy, something fishy going on. Uh, and this is actually, um, the, like, well, now we're talking about like the user agents. So in this case, like secure messenger applications. Um, wire for, for desktop, this is like the example here, and Telegram. 
So I zoomed in as well, like some 400 um, 400%. And you can see that uh, in here, like, so, well, actually, I have to explain a few things before. So I registered, like, here, I think there used to be Nokia Maps or something like that. So I registered, like, a full homographic version of it in, in Cyrillic for, like, as part of research for this talk. So I was doing all these tests and so on with this, some of these domains that I actually owned. Uh, and by the way, I'm actually happy to give them back to here, like, if they're interested. Uh, because all the research is pretty much gone by now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, let's go back here. So this is the legitimate one uh, and the homograph one, how, how wire renders them. You can see that pretty much everything is exactly the same. There is just something off in the R. But it, this is because we zoomed in a lot, like 400% uh, 400 actually. So like pretty much like five times as much. Uh, and in Telegram, some characters as well, like for example, the uh, H is a bit off in this particular case, but then, we, as we'll see later, there are some characters that are completely indistinguishable, too. Uh, yeah, so this is actually the, the Telegram with iOS as well and Wire. So just yeah, let's move on with with this. Um, so essentially, uh, we we're talking about this, like as I mentioned, the ICANN had this resolution back in 20 years ago or so when they came up with it. But then they realized that uh, there were like a few flaws in, in the way they uh, were actually allowing people to register domains. So uh, essentially, it was possible to, they, they realized that, oh, there is this confusable homograph thing. And this actually can be a problem. So it means that people can register like google.com with the, uh, uh, say, the E that looks like the E from the one in Cyrillic. And then that would be well, that would be very complicated to actually uh, slow down these attacks. So uh, in, this in these slides, we are talking about some of the rules around the registration of homograph domains. And they vary a lot depending on the top level domain registrar as well. So for example, the .NET, .com, .tv, and so on, they allow different scripts from many languages. So you can see, like, well, it allows Portuguese, Romanian, Javanese, Thai, and all, like, all these characters, for example. Uh, and a few others are more permissive, like .ws, .to, I think .la. You can even come up with emojis. Even though, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the RFC doesn't allow emojis to be there. But, well, it's not the first time that people don't really follow RFCs as they should. Um, and, for example, like .berlin, uh, Latin and Syriac script are only the ones that gets allowed. So some of top-level domains, they're actually a bit more restrictive than, than, uh, than others. So yeah, as I say, like in the version one, it allowed mixed scripts. And then they realized, well, this is actually a security problem. And there will be a lot of trouble in the future with that. And uh, I think like up to 2000, well, yeah, a couple of years ago, there came up like a few other versions of this resolution called uh, well, version 2 and 3 that they disallowed mixed scripts. However, pure scripts are still completely fine to register. And now that we see here, so all these examples here, like PayPal, Apple, Opera, and so on, they're all homograph domains that actually could be registered because there was no way to stop from registering uh, pure script homographs. And like and many others, the list goes on and on and on. So now we're going to see um, some actual practical attacks, like see how this is actually going to build up into actual computer security problems. So um, the practical attacks, like the very first time this, even before IDN was actually um, reintroduced by ECON, and even before all these um, internationalized domains were even a thing. So this was like back in 2001. The two Israeli researchers, they said, oh, this is actually going to be a security problem. And the original paper is very interesting. It's very short. It's like only, I think, two or three pages. And like, I, I totally recommend the read to understand more about these issues. But only lately, I think like the past couple of years, especially like this year, it has been picking up a lot. And phishing, uh, like all these fishers and other different adversaries are now noticing this. And we are seeing a rise in, in such attacks. And like, I think it's also very important to speak briefly about some historical and recent bugs uh, related to homographs. So Firefox, uh, like back in 2005, uh, the guy from Eric Johansson from Shimu Group 
he uh, filled in a ticket with uh, within Firefox, like with, with Bugzilla, saying, "Hey, like you guys are not doing anything to prevent such attacks." This was actually, imp imp unfortunately, taken as a P3 importance bug, even though I think it should be, it's actually definitely something uh, that should be higher. But like, so this was like a visual spoofing the URL bar that we're going to see some of this. Uh, a bit later down the talk. Uh, recently, there have been like a few CVEs, like one for Safari that this letter uh, called Doom. It was interpreted exactly as like this is like a Latin letter from well some some language that nobody probably even speaks anymore, but still like is in the script of Latin script. And the way it was rendered by Safari it was just purely rendered as a D instead of this Doom. Uh, also, just recently in 2019. There was one K in, in Cyrillic that was interpreted as actually actual K in, in ASCII. And there was also this research by, uh, well, I don't know, I cannot speak the guy's name, I'm sorry, uh, that he also found like different vulnerabilities in the way Chrome, Firefox, and, and a few other browsers, I think Opera as well, how they reacted to, to these kind of problems. And, and, and as a response, Chrome at least uh, came up with uh, an improvement in the algorithm to detect this confusable, and like it's probably like the best one that you have these days. And like again, like there are a few tickets open in the bugzilla of Firefox. They treated this as a P3 importance again, whereas Chrome treated it as a P1. And as Tor browser is also based on Firefox, uh, on Firefox. It, it means that it's also vulnerable. And unfortunately, I don't know why, but people from Tor Browser, they could just go and fix this thing, but they claim that they are waiting for Chrome, I'm sorry, for Firefox to know what they're going to do in upstream in order to finally fix it. I don't think it's actually a very acceptable uh, excuse, but anyway, it's just my personal opinion. So yeah, uh, the way browsers handle IDNs. So after these homographic attacks that were published by, by this uh, Chinese researcher in 2017, Chrome stepped up the game uh, big time, like mad props for that. Um, and then Firefox, also top browser, still like lagging behind. Um, but yeah, like uh, the way that they handle uh, IDNs, Chrome is actually probably has a, has a very complex policy that seems to do very well, like to, to preventing these attacks. Opera and Brave, I think they follow the same, the same algorithm as Chrome when I was doing tests. That's what it seemed to me, at least. Internet Explorer, surprisingly, was never really vulnerable to this thing. Like this is probably the only class of bugs Internet Explorer was never vulnerable to. Uh, whereas Firefox and Tor browser is still are still lagging behind, as I just mentioned. So now moving on to email client and, and web mails. So uh, this is what I call a backstabbing friend. So for the sake of user friendliness, some web mails and some email clients, they convert that puny code that we just saw, like X and dash dash and some weird other characters, uh, back into Unicode, like to make it user friendly. But very often there are no checks for confusable, uh, for confusable characters. They are not made. So as we're going to see here now, with uh, there is an example. There is Hush Mail. So Hush Mail is like a secure mail uh, provider. And as, if you really, really zoom, you're going to see like this is actually a domain that I own as well. Uh, it's kind of like a, an, part of this research of this IDN homograph. Uh, Facebook with the something on top of the K. So if you just see like in your in your computer, like it, it, it's as if like there is some dirt on your screen. That's it. You would just um, just pass as looks to you as Facebook.com, and this actually goes straight into your inbox. It doesn't get flagged by anti-spam or, or anything, or at least not with hush mail and with a few other services that, that I tested, include some big ones that I well, unfortunately cannot really speak about now because they have not fixed it yet. Uh, also, there is there was actually even assigned a CVE recently in Roundcube. So again, I Using my domain here.com, there's like that X and dash dash something. If I send an email to anyone using Roundcube, it, Roundcube will just convert it back to make it user friendly and it will appear as if it comes from here.com. Again, uh, no checks and nothing else. I mean, it's actually, Roundcube is doing exactly what it's supposed to do deliver email. So it will just go straight into your inbox, but then from a visual standpoint, you're gonna, you can essentially spoof the domain name where this comes from. 
And now uh, this, well, how Signal handled this, this was also assigned a CVE earlier this year. So Signal both from, uh, for Android and Windows were vulnerable to this. So if you see here, can you spot the fake URL? There is actually no way to tell from a visual standpoint. Signal for iOS, for, I don't know why, but it made the, fa the link that was homograph unclickable. So like, that's great. For iOS, it didn't work. But for the other versions, uh, they were actually vulnerable. Telegram as well had the, had the same issue. And Telegram actually went even as far as making that, you know, that quick preview of, uh, of the website, so using the fake one. So you, can, you could really make pull off like a real, uh, very convincing phishing uh, attacks with that. So let's just like, talk about actually a quick demo here with homograph attacks with Signal and Tor browser. I hope the video, all right. Uh, yeah, so let's. So, uh, by the way, these issues were fixed by Signal uh, a couple of months back. Uh, also, actually, Telegram fixed it for a while, but it seems that they just reintroduced it. When I was checking things for the talk this week, and it seems like it went back, so some regression was not really done properly. But yeah, let's see the video here. Uh, the attack, so yeah, it's a fake link of apple.com, totally legit, you can click. And then the URL bar, there is no way to tell. Sorry to interrupt you, you have to move it over there. Oh, I have to. Oh, sorry, how to do that? I don't know. <laughs> All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, so yeah, back here to the video. So yeah, it's like fake Apple. Yeah, the URL bar would just display Apple and so on. And and Tor browser is still vulnerable to this, both like in the mobile version and in the in the desktop version. So let's back to. All right, I don't know how to use my own computer. Like I don't know where. <laughs> That's actually shameful. Uh, I I need some help again. <laughs> I don't. Uh, all right. I don't know. To the. Oh yeah, I need some help again. Sorry about that. So yeah, talking all about this hacking and everything, but yeah, like some basic stuff in the computer cannot do. That's pretty shameful. All right. So as we just saw, like these issues here, and now I think like it's very important to talk about like how to defend yourself. Um, you know, honestly, like for browsers, preferably just use Google Chrome. Like they are the ones actually putting an effort in preventing such attacks, um, and well, and also many other security uh, relevant stuff that Chrome does. So it's totally worth it using it. There are like a few extensions developed by third parties, like Fish.ai is one of them, that also prevents uh, and detects some attacks. I believe there are other other extensions too uh, that, that that will pretty much do the same. Uh, for Firefox, you can actually turn off the whole thing with showing Punicode to true. So it means that it will never show again all this, uh, the Unicode thing. It will just show the actual Punicode of it. Uh, for email, like uh, for Malitested, Outlook, ProtoMail, Tutanota, uh, and are, are they fine? Uh, other popular ones, not so much as we just saw Hushmail, and there are like a few other, especially webmail providers, that they have not. Uh, done any any work yet on this? Even though like some of them actually uh, reported this that hey I think it's a problem. Some of them replied, some of them not. Some of them are slower than others to fix things. Uh, and then again, this is like Chrome just introduced it I think like a month, month and a half ago. Uh, so basically, Chrome has a list of the like 10,000 most visited websites, and it will actually do some sort of work to detect like oh it looks like. Somebody's trying to pull off a non-home graph attack against, um, against GitHub. And are you sure you want to go to github.com or to this thing that's dodgy and somebody's trying to fish you? And also from a defense perspective, uh, from, the, sorry, from the human eye perspective, there were like a proposal that never really took off that they wanted to 
have different colors in the letters that are not Latin uh, alphabet. So, I mean, the ones that are Latin confusable. Uh, this never really took off, like it's probably not that great from a, from a user interface and user experience point of view. And I think that's why it, it never really picked up momentum. Uh, there are a few developer, uh, sorry, uh, application developers. There are like a few libraries that they check for confusable, so they would just do part of this of the heavyweight uh, of for you. And now we are wrapping up the talk. So essentially, uh, confusable homographs they have been a look around for a while, as we saw since well, some 20 years or so, since like, pretty much the very introduction of internationalized domain names by Aitkan, but very little has been discussed around them, and they're very frequently overlooked. And these issues are not really part of threat model for many applications, as they are very often considered social engineering. So actually, good luck for, for you. Uh, if you're trying to submit something like this to a bug bounty program, many of them will say, hey, this is social engineering attack. It's out of scope for uh, for my program. But uh, actually, some of the security messages, I actually got a bounty from one of them that I didn't really mention here because, uh, well, it's part of, we cannot really speak about it, that, um, but it's part of the bug bounty program. But I think it was the only one that actually gave a small reward for, for this kind of issue. Even though in the very beginning they said it's not, a security, it's not a security issue because they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do is to display links. But yeah, if you're displaying a link of Google and when they click there, it takes you somewhere else, oh, it's probably something off. Um, and ultimately, I think application security teams, they can do much more at being proactive in preventing these threats. Like for example, Google Chrome is actually doing a pretty good job with that. Not only now recently showing the user, this interface to the user, hey, are you sure you're going to the right, correct website? And also improving their algorithms to show uh, the domain names. And whereas like many other softwares are not actually doing it, uh, instead of asking for users to be like vigilant and please don't click on bad links or stuff like that, so it's just not really an option. Or even worse, waiting for ECAN to come up with a magic solution for the problem. I believe I remember that one of these secure messengers, when I reported this issue to them, they said, well, this is also not a problem because we are doing exactly what we're supposed to do, display links, and this is a problem with ICANN and registrars. We have, like, trying to shift the blame. No, it's actually, it's not their fault. It's actually the, the fact that you're not really doing this thing correctly. Um, and the, here are like a few references um, about the um, about this research. I really recommend reading them up if you're interested. And yeah, thank you very much. Still question time now. Thank you for the talk. Um, do we have any questions from the room here? Uh, on the internet? Nope. Wow. This is really amazing. So yeah. this I hope I explained everything so well there's no questions asked. Yeah, it kind of seems like that. <laughs> there are no questions unanswered on this amazing topic. Okay, great. Then we'll wrap it up and call it a night. And thank you very much. And give him one more warm hand. And <laughs>